Remember, we've been talking about pass-fail signals and experiments. So as you get out of the building and start talking to these potential customers, you need to set up some experiments. How do I know these are the right customers or the right buyers? And so you want to set up a series of experiments to test interest and figure out where do you want to test it and what kind of experiments can you run and how many do you test? By the way, the how many is a classic question and the answer is it depends. In a business-to-business -business enterprise sale, you might get away with you know talking to less than 20 customers and that's a great number. But if you have a mobile or web app, you want to talk to hundreds if not thousands of customers. Now, obviously, you can't personally interview all those like you could in the enterprise, and so you want to get out and reach them virtually. But the number you want to get to really is an order of magnitude or two different than if you were doing B2B direct sales. Just a caveat and a, and a warning, when you're out of the building trying to talk to hundreds or thousands of potential web or mobile app users, you want to be careful that you're not completely dependent on online surveys. People simply lie on surveys. And so what you want to have is some sample where you actually bring those people into your building or you go see them and you watch their pupils dilate as you actually ask them the question and see if that kind of diverges from the data you're getting when they're hitting your website or you're sending them questionnaires. And then you'll have a correlation to be able to figure out is that data valid or not. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to reach hundreds or thousands of people for customer discovery. Now one other thing about the business model canvas in general, uh, now that we've talked about customer segments, is understanding that sometimes you have multiple customers, multiple segments. And it's kind of interesting to take a look at Google as an example. So let's just take a look at Google search. Now let's just think about, you know, who's the customer for Google search? It's anyone searching on the web or mobile. And the product we have is a free search bar or free uh, mobile app. And you know, what are the key resources? Well, they need software and software developers and installed user base. But the key idea is this product is free. And if you think about uh, the cost structure for this, it requires massive data centers and software development and key activities or data center scale and speed. But the key idea is the revenue model is free. But Google and Google search is one of the most profitable businesses on the face of the earth. Well, how can Google do that? Well, think about it. What we've just been doing is Google has been acquiring users. But someone else is paying for this product. And that someone else is a different customer segment called advertisers. So we had users here, but we now have payers here. Now, what's really interesting is for every customer segment, we have a value proposition. We had a free search bar for the users, but for the advertisers we have a completely different product. We have Google AdWords and our customer relationships are different. For users it was kind of an automated process. You just basically went to the Google website or you downloaded a Google toolbar. But for payers it might be automated, but they also have telemarketing and direct sales to go after big advertisers. But their distribution channel, in addition to being automated, is also self-service and direct sales. But the key thing to note is that not only do they have different segments and different value props and different customer relationships, more importantly, they have a different revenue model. It's a big idea. Multiple customer segments require multiple value props, uh, multiple customer relationships, sometimes different channels, but always different revenue models. These are the payers. So Google search is a, what we call a two-sided market. There are users and there are payers. As we discussed, some businesses are multi-sided. In this case, let's take a look at a two-sided market and match the market with the appropriate business. So the answer is, for LinkedIn, uh, there are two sides to this market. There are the workers as a customer segment, and there are recruiters. For Visa, you'd have banks and merchants. For eBay, you'd have sellers and buyers. And the New York Times and almost every newspaper, radio, television, Google, you have readers and you have advertisers. So understanding multi-sided markets are just understanding which customer segments in a two-sided market use and which other customer segment pays. 
So just to summarize, for Google Search, each had its own value proposition, but most importantly, each had its own revenue stream, and one segment cannot exist without the other. That is, if you had users but you had no revenue, you'd be out of business over time. But if you had a revenue model but no users, there, was, there would be no reason for those advertisers to show up. Now, this was an example of a two-sided market. Let's see what happens when we have multiple sites. So Google Search was a very simple multi-sided market, just two sites. There were users and there were payers. But can the canvas actually work with something more complicated like in life sciences? So here's an example of a business model canvas from a life sciences company that was going to provide E. coli cell lines for simplified downstream processing. And they said, oh, our customer segment is segmented in niche marketing. Now, in hindsight, after the end of the class, um, they were the ones who actually went in and said, well, uh, yeah, that was kind of a definition of what a customer segment was, but they didn't really, really describe who. And their value proposition, as even they uh, realized later, was pretty unclear. And their channels, uh, when they said web sales and trade shows and direct sales, you know, in hindsight, looked pretty unrealistic. And uh, for uh, partners, uh, they just said, well, you know, when we look at it now, it really kind of looks like a random list of hopefuls. So let's see how they got from... Uh, something that started over here, which uh, you shouldn't laugh because your first canvas might look like this, and what happened after they got out of the building. And so now you could see, instead of segmented and niche market only, they started to understand, oh, maybe the market is somebody in something specific, by a farmer, by a technology or food, still kind of vague, but they're getting a little better. And then um, they're still a little vague on their feature set and gains and pains and value proposition. They're getting a little more refined about partners. Um, and then as they went down, they kind of understood, oh, we understand what a value proposition is. It's not like what our technology is. It's what gain and pain we're providing. So simplify protein purification, increase yield, increase throughput, decrease cost. Now we're making a lot more sense. And now if you look at customer segments, oh, now they're actually getting down to very specific groups. Not yet the people in them, but they're now actually going, Oh, these are the people we should be talking to, and our partners are now also getting specific, and they're getting some very interesting traction on what potential revenue streams were. And if we look at their next rev, the things in red are the changes. So now they're looking at industrial enzyme manufacturers, and uh, their key activities are R&D and production support is their next change. And then finally, they now kind of verified, yep, these look like our customer segments. Um, here's our customer relationships. More than likely, we'll make money from royalties and commercial licensing, etc. And so you can see multiple customer segments, multiple value props, multiple revenue streams. This is a somewhat complex multi-sided market. Just by the way, as a note, some of the most complex are actually in the medical device business, where you have users and payers and hospitals and insurance companies and regulators, etc. And each one needs a value proposition. Each one needs to, you need to understand the revenue model. And so some business model canvases can be quite complex. Now, what's interesting, by the way, about this life sciences company is here's something that you would think, who could I call? I'm just a scientist. I mean, you might be an entrepreneur building an iOS app, and at least you could ask your friends. Who do you ask about, you know, E. coli-based purification platforms? Well, basically, they decided to go through their Rolodex of all the trade shows and all the conferences and all the people they've met in their careers. And instead of physically driving out to them, they used Skype and they used uh, phone calls. And they started a cold calling strategy, which set a stage for a conversation. And they had two or three of their team on the call. So they would send a message to contact. They'd set an appointment. They'd send out a short summary electronically. They'd have a conversation and follow-up. And they also used survey tools. They used LinkedIn and SurveyMonkey. But when we were counting how many contacts they made, we didn't actually count them in their progress. So one last thing, and uh, we've been avoiding bringing this up until now, but it's something you as an entrepreneur should know. It's a secret. And it's a secret that we didn't even understand for a long time. And that secret is there are four types of startups. And not knowing which type you are can really sink your company. So we call this 
market type. It turns out that there really are four types of markets for startups. One is the existing market. Another is where you take a segment or resegment an existing market. Another is a new market, and another is a clone market. So let's take a look why this is important, and then we'll give you the definition of each one. It turns out that the type of market changes everything. It changes your initial market size, how much it costs to enter the market, what kind of launch you do of your product. It affects the type of competitive barriers you have and how you position or describe your product. It affects your sales model. Are you going to hire direct sales? When do you hire them? What kind of margins you should have or the profit? How long it takes, that is the sales cycle, and something called the chasm width, which we'll take a look in a second. It also affects how much money you're going to need to raise and how long it takes to get to profitability. And then finally, it affects the types of customers and what their needs are and how long it takes to adopt. So one of the things this looks like is just a checklist of market type seems to affect everything. What the heck can it be? So let's go a little further and define it. Existing market. Well, the customers, well, they're known. We know who they are. They exist. The customer needs? Well, we could ask them, what do they really care about for gains and pains? They could tell us. Competitors? By definition, there are many. Your risk? Well, your risk is lack of branding, lack of sales, lack of distribution, and well, unfortunately, sometimes your product really doesn't live up to the claims. Example, um, Google. It's an existing market. Um, go ahead and try to enter the search business today. There's a dominant player in search. Resegmented market. Well, you have a hypothesis about who the customers are. That is, you think you understand what your fit is, either in low cost or their specific niche needs, and so you might have a better fit for them. And competitors, there's many if you're wrong, but very few if you're right. And your risk is that you get the market and product redefinition just wrong. You didn't do enough customer discovery and you say, no, 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 this is how we're going to enter this existing market. We're going to go after these set of users specifically. And oops, you were wrong. A great example of this is what Southwest did. Southwest took on the airline industry by bringing up the traditional hub and spoke model and providing just very limited services, but for an extremely low price. Another is a new market, and here the customers are really unknown. All you have is a vision and a set of hypotheses. And what you're hoping is you're going to provide for customers is something transformational. Not just incremental improvement, but transformational improvement. And the good news is, and bad news, is that there are no competitors on day one. It's pretty lonely. So for this market to exist, you're going to have to create it through a force of will and a lot of money. And that's going to require evangelism and education. An example, Groupon. Right? Groupon single-handedly created the daily deals market. A clone market, the customers are possibly known because you're going to copy an existing market like the United States, but the customer needs and why it's a clone is you're going to actually localize all those specific issues for your country or region. There are no competitors if you're first, and the risk is misjudging the local needs. A great example is Baidu. So one of the interesting things about market type is that it really gives us a handle in trying to understand the expected time of profitability from shortest to longest. Take a look at the list below and rank the markets in order of expected time to profitability. So when we look at an existing market, it's clear that if you've uh, matched those market needs, you could be achieving profitability the soonest. If you were doing a clone market, that is uh, copying a U.S. business model in a foreign country, that probably is the second closest to immediate profitability uh, because you know the market exists, uh, you just need to implement it in your local country. Resegmented market, well, uh, that's probably somewhere in between existing and clone and new uh, because you not only have to understand the market, you have to understand the customer's specific niche or low-cost needs. But the longest time to profitability is a new market. You have a vision, uh, you understand what the future might look like, but the market just hasn't adopted yet, and that might take years. Again, a little further definition, an existing market, incumbents exist, 
Customers can name the market. Customers want or need better performance, and it's usually a technology-driven play. Positioning is driven by the product and how much value customers place on its features. The risks in an existing market is thinking that the incumbents are dumb. Typically, incumbents, unless they're large corporations that are falling asleep, will defend their turf. Remember the network effects of an incumbent. It might mean that it's not only about their product, but it might be all the ancillary services and third-party offerings they have in their catalog. And remember, just as you're focused on innovation, most incumbents are focused on innovation. So before you jump into an existing market, you need to take a look at the innovation rate of the incumbents. Now, one of the interesting things is trying to figure out what sales look like and, and what's the adoption rate in a new market. It turns out one of the interesting curves for um, startup companies is a uh, technology lifecycle adoption curve uh, popularized by Jeff Moore in a book called Crossing the Chasm. And Moore postulated that there was a gap, a chasm, between visionaries and the mainstream and pragmatic uh, and conservative market. It turns out, though, in an existing market, that chasm between these early adopters and the mainstream is very small or non-existent. Because if you're right entering an existing market, your sales curve, the spreadsheet you're putting together for your revenue, if you get it correctly, should look just like this. You're taking market share from incumbents from day one. In an existing market, if customers react to your hypotheses that what they needed was higher performance and you were correct, this is your revenue curve. Congratulations. Now the other thing is in a resegmented market, again we use Southwest as a low cost entrant, or Whole Foods as a unique uh, niche supplier via positioning, what you really want to start asking is what factors can you eliminate that your industry has long competed on or what can you reduce below the industry standard or, or raised above the industry standard or what can be created that uh, the industry has never offered. Now what's interesting is if you look at the chasm between your early adopters, your early evangelists and the mainstream market in a resegmented market, this is what Moore was kind of talking about called the chasm. There really is a gap between what these people want and a gap between their needs. And if you're not careful, your sales curve, while it would start looking like this over here, actually might collapse until the mainstream adopts. So let's take a look at what a sales curve might look like in a resegmented market. And it's a complex uh, sales growth chart because in the first couple of years, you're just kind of getting the spillover of people who kind of think you're just a competitor in the existing market. And your sales will kind of tootle along until if you're correct and you were right about that niche or low cost segmentation, you will start seeing an exponential increase in sales. And if you're wrong, well, you'll just kind of be one of the many competitors in an existing market. Now, the next market type is a new market. Customers don't exist today. That's the real questions are, if they don't exist, how will anybody find out about you and how will they even become aware that they need to be in this new market? And by the way, how do you know the market size of something that doesn't even exist today? The market size is zero. And what factors should you create the, that the industry has never offered? Now, a way to look at this is take a look at the chasm. Man, this is scary. That is, you can sell to the crazy people all you want, the early evangelists, the early adopters, and that's nice, but you'll have a small business until you figure out how do we get the masses to adopt. And here's what that hockey stick sales curve looks like. Here are the early people you're selling to, and one of the mistakes that startups and entrepreneurs and founders make is look at that slope of those early sales. And when you get them, you go, great time to like kick up spending and look at this. Our board's happy and why don't we start doing advertising and staffing up the company. But then it kind of declines and people scratch their head going, what's going on? What's going on is the mainstream market just hasn't adopted. And this might go on for years and never kick in. But if you're lucky, you'll hit a tipping point and market adoption happens. And when it happens, it happens faster than you could imagine. But at times, it takes longer to get there than you can imagine.
So in a new market, one of the things you need to be thinking about is that is there any possible way to move this curve in? There's a couple of really interesting things to notice about a new market. One is this valley of death of almost no sales can continue for years. Now, why is this important to know? Well, just imagine you're a startup and you've put together a nice financial forecast for your board and your investors and they all believe that you are in an existing market. So they're expecting you to have revenue that increases every year. Why? Because you've never asked the question, what type of market am I in? Now, if you're in a new market, you now know that it's quite possible that you might have a curve that doesn't look like this, but actually is flat for a long period of time. So the consequences of understanding a new market are essential for a startup. This was a startup killer for decades. In a new market, there are no customers. So revenues might extend out for years. In fact, if you think about what happened during the dot-com bubble in the beginning of the 21st century, is every startup executed like they were in an existing market. They hired salespeople, they spent marketing dollars, and in, in scale of tens of millions of dollars, trying to create and use your demand for a market that didn't exist. Just imagine what would have happened if those startups would have parked their capital in a bank, getting interest, and doing guerrilla activities to help start the market. Because the market wasn't there. There is no way any individual startup can accelerate technology diffusion. So for a new market to take off, lots of things external to your startup need to happen. Regulation needs to change. Platforms need to become cheaper. Customer tastes need to change, etc. The dot-com bubble was actually predicated on all of these things happening all at once, and they didn't. And therefore, all that money that got raised got spent trying to acquire customers when there were none. The test for whether you're in a new market is not whether 30 people in your uh, regional cluster or in Silicon Valley or New York have heard about your technology. The, the real test is whether your grandmother in Omaha or Berlin or in Uganda actually have heard about the technology or the product or the market. And if the market doesn't exist there, you might be spending a lot of money trying to create a market where there is none. Premature spending is the killer for startups. So let's take a look at the last type of market. That's the clone market. This takes foreign business models and adopts it to local conditions. What's a foreign business model? Typically right now, uh, a foreign business model is one that's occurring in the U.S. What's a local condition? Well, if your language is different than English or your culture is different uh, than the U.S. or if your country has import restrictions or local control and ownership and you have a market large enough to support a business model, typically countries with north of 100 million people that fit this criteria might be China, India, Russia, Brazil, even the EU itself. Just cloning U.S. business models that exist is not a bad business strategy. So let's follow our Jersey Square team and see what they did with customer segments. Now, what happened is they got out of the building and this time actually spoke to a series of customers. They spoke to over 60. And what they found out was what they originally thought was a single customer segment actually turned out to be there were two separate segments. It turned out there were the original segment they thought rabid sports jersey owners who were male, 13 to 35, who passionately followed their team and went to a lot of games. But there were also people who casually attended games, male and female, and they uh, kind of were closer to 18 to 30, and they were casual fans. So number one is you can now see that there are not only two customer segments, but there are two value propositions. That is, there's a value proposition that matches each one of the segments and there's a revenue stream that matches each one of the segments. And so now you can kind of see the power of the canvas. This is a multi-sided market. Uh, you have at least uh, two customer segments, and uh, you have two value props and uh, uh, tendant revenue streams. Now you should notice what the Jersey Square team did wonderfully well is they actually started with the archetype. Um, the archetype, though, if you remember, is kind of the end result of understanding the pain and the gain uh, we were solving. 
uh, with the value proposition. So they really were missing talking about gains and pains over here as well. And it would have been great if they had that um, added in, but a pretty good job in trying to understand what their archetype was, uh, which needed to match their minimum viable product uh, over here. So we covered a lot of material in the customer segment part of the business model canvas. We talked about the jobs to be done, we talked about pains, we talked about gains, we talked about multi-sided markets, and we closed with market type. Let me give you an example of a couple of startups who actually went and tried to define their customer segments. So here was one uh, that the startup was actually trying to understand how to find foreign students at universities. And so they were putting together their archetype. And this was just a definition of meet this student, and here's who they are, and here's their family, and oh, this is their first time in America. And because it was about uh, providing financial services to foreign students, they actually understood something about their credit score, about social security number, U.S. address, whether they were responsible academically and financially, and whether their social network was responsible. Another example of a customer segment was uh, someone making new kiteboarding equipment. Who were their customers, professional kite surfers, they solely concerned with performance, uh, but they had another segment, average kite surfers. And they had a third, prospective kite surfers. And, <laughs> and though I don't think they were this young, they were actually trying to understand how to segment their market and what their specific performance needs for kite surfs were in each segment. The other thing that we're interested in doing, if you remember in customer segments, is understanding the day in the life of a customer. Now, sometimes this could actually be diagrammed as how do they spend their time? And this happens to be how does a designer spend their time putting together an architectural product. So how much they spend in phase one and in prototyping and manufacturing and final product. And so this was giving them a view of what it would look like. And so they could now describe to me and others, oh, and our product fits right here and here's why, etc. Here was another example of someone trying to understand the customer problem of couples who happen to be on separate coasts or long distance from each other. And they were trying to understand what the problems were. And so they were able to articulate all the key pieces and, and kind of rank them by priority. And I thought this was a great way to kind of diagram the problem. Here was another example of a team putting together a detailed archetype of a set of customers. They gave their archetype a name, Pat the Professional. Specified who Pat was, upwardly mobile, professional, salary, what they did, how much they spend, what their demographics are, what their traits were, what their motivations were, how many were there, where they worked, where they bought, etc. I thought this was a great example of a professional class consumer uh, who was shopping frequently online. Another example in medical devices, trying to understand two segments, oncologists and pathologists. Here's what they did, here's what they cared about, and more importantly, here's how they paid. Here's how they paid in the hospital, and here's they, how they got reimbursed. Here's another example of a uh, mammography product, how patient care worked uh, inside of a hospital, and how people got reimbursed. So you can find these examples and more on the link below.